There we go. I kind of didn't want to come up here. I thought, let's just do it again, do it again. Y'all can be seated. Or you can stand. I don't care. I'm going to stand. At least for the next hour and a half or so. Just kidding. Hey, we are in week three of a series called Mind Over Matter. And I just, I want to remind you, if you've been here, and clarify if you haven't, if you're just showing up today, um, that we are not talking about the psychological or the new age aspects in which that phrase is often used, right? So we're not looking at um, ways that we can come to some new self-realization and be a better person as we put our mind to it. Uh, We're not um, talking about self-determination to overcome obstacles in our life by our own will and power. Here's what we are doing, though. Uh, Mind over matter is just us acknowledging that the Spirit of God within those of us who follow Jesus and believe in him, makes the mind of Christ available to us. And the mind of Christ changes the way that we view the world around us, and it changes the way that we interact with the world around us because it changes us. Right? So it doesn't just give us some new list of religious rules to follow. It changes our very hearts, and by that it changes how we interact with the world around us. And so mind over matter is simply us as followers of Jesus, applying the mind of Christ to everyday life. We're in the book of Philippians. We are running through the book of Philippians, four chapters, four weeks, and we're really just kind of getting a a look at some of the main themes out of it. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 3 today, so you can turn there to follow along in a bit. Um, Let me ask you, though, before we read today, how many of you um, have a letter or a card that you either remember receiving or you've held on to it for sentimental reasons. Anybody have a card like that? Some of you have boxes full, right? Pack rats. You've kept all of them since your first birthday, I know. Um, I've got several cards and letters and things that have uh, meant something to me over the years from uh, church members and from family members, and I, I keep a small selection of those. I had this one letter, though, that my mom wrote to me back in 1974 when I was just three years old, and now I know mom's story. And so I understand that she wrote this letter at one of the most difficult times in her life. I know that she was in an abusive relationship at the time with my birth father, and so she was facing divorce, facing the, the coming um, weight of being a single mom. She was facing the likelihood of being shunned by the community that she was a part of, and yet while all of this is going on, Mom takes time to write a note to me, and in this note, she speaks blessings over my life, and she speaks hope over my life, and and tells me what great things she sees in store for me. Maybe you've got a special letter like that, and you can remember the joy of receiving it. I didn't get that letter until I was an adult, and I loved reading that letter, and I didn't just read it once. I read that letter a lot when I need a little more encouragement, And, and maybe you've got a letter like that. What I want you to to understand is um, that Paul actually wrote a letter to the Philippian church. We know that, but I want you to understand it in a way that you feel it. That this isn't just a book to be studied. This is a letter that was written to a church who was a beloved group of people by a man who loved them deeply. Now, you can read the story of Paul and um, the Philippian church in Acts chapter 16. I'll summarize it for you. But what we find is that Paul, on one of his missionary journeys, was prevented by the Spirit from going north. He was prevented from going south. And instead, through a dream, Paul was directed to the region of Macedonia. And when he went to Macedonia, he found himself in the town of Philippi. And there, Paul established this church. And along with it, some pretty significant relationships And we see that Paul just has a deep love for this church, that there's something special about this church that endears his heart to it, even beyond the love that he has for many of the other churches that he established. And the same was true for the Philippians. They loved him dearly. He was a beloved spiritual influence in their lives. And so this letter, I want you to, as we read it, understand it's really a love letter from Paul to these people. Just like my mom wrote that letter to me in one of the most difficult seasons of her life, Paul is writing to this church uh, under house arrest. He's awaiting trial. It is a difficult time for Paul. And yet he finds within himself the strength to write 
good things to and about and encouragements toward and direction for this new church. Now, it just so happens this is also a letter that was inspired by the Holy Spirit. So that kind of multiplies the significance of it and the fact that we probably ought to listen to it. Now, before we read, also, um, here's what we found so far in this letter. In chapter 1, we found that the mind of Christ produces in us a single mind, and the single mind produced by the mind of Christ causes us to focus on not what we think matters most, but on what God says matters most, and that is the gospel of Jesus experienced personally and passed on to other people. That was chapter 1, summarized. Now, last week, Josh t- talked to us out of chapter 2 and showed us that the mind of Christ also produces a submissive mind. And that's the kind of mind that puts other people over the good of ourselves and causes us to humble ourselves and to serve others just like Jesus did to us. And now today in chapter 3, we're going to add that the mind of Christ produces in us a spiritual mind, and the spiritual mind affects how we view ourselves. it affects what we hold on to, and it affects who we follow. Uh, the question we're answering today is how do I deal with the limitations and the expectations and the temptations of the world around me? Right, how do I deal with the weight of this world and the pull of this world and the accusations of this world? It's basically with all the junk that the world throws my way. How do I overcome that? And here's your answer. You have to choose to accept and apply what is true and what's best according to the mind of Christ. I know it's a mouthful, so I'll say it one more time in case you're writing things down. But if you want to know how to deal with the weight and the pull of this world, you have to choose to accept and apply what is true and what's best according to the mind of Christ. And let me just say that what is true about you and what's best for you has already been determined and declared by God. If you're one of his kids, you've received Christ as Savior. He's already laid out there before you what's true and best. And so that's why I say we have to choose to accept it and to apply it. That's what's necessary. The spiritual mind that we have from Christ affects the way we view ourselves. Look at Philippians chapter 3 and verse 3. Now in verse 2, Paul warns this Philippian church about people that have been speaking lies to them and about them regarding their identity in Christ. We know that the Philippian believers are believers. They belong to Jesus, and yet there's this other group of people saying, yeah, maybe you've experienced that, but you haven't done these things, and until you do these things, you're not really a kid of God's. So you need to follow our rules. And Paul is saying, baloney, here's what's true. Look at verse 3. He says, you guys need to know, it is we who are the circumcision." What he's saying is Jesus has transformed our hearts, and it's we who serve God by his spirit. And so those who are telling you that you haven't yet arrived must not see the way that you serve because it's by the spirit. And the only way you serve by the spirit is if you have the spirit. You belong. He says it's we who boast in Christ Jesus. It's we who put no confidence in the flesh. And you you move on down to verse 20, and he speaks another form of identity over these guys when he says that our citizenship is in heaven. And so what Paul is doing here is speaking spiritual reality and spiritual identity over the Philippian church. He's reminding them of who they really are despite what other people say they are or are or not. Now, too often, our true identity gets tangled up in the identity lies of the world. You guys ever experienced that? Maybe you know what the Bible says about you. You know what's true according to Jesus, but the weight of the world, the pull of the world, the lies of the world cloud what you believe to be true. Sometimes, We believe those lies, and you've got your own list, right, your own set of lies. Um, I've got my own. I've been dating them for 30 years. I've broken up several times. They just keep coming back, keep wanting to be a part of my life. I'll get to that in a minute, but here's some of the other lies. There's a long list of lies. Some of us believe the lie that we are failures, and we look at experiences in our life and times when we have failed, and we just listen to the world and think, well, I must just be a failure as a mom, a failure as a dad, a failure as a friend or a leader. Some of us believe the lies that say that we're insignificant, that our lives don't matter, we have no meaning and no purpose, nobody notices us, 
or the lies that say that you're not good enough. You're not as good as your big brother is. You're not as good as she is. You're not as good as they want you to be. You're no good. You believe that lie. There are lies that say that we're broken and we're weak and we're shameful because of our past sin. Here's my two lies, rejected and abandoned. I look back at my story and recognize that after mom's divorce, whenever I was younger, uh, my birth father walked away. I didn't see him for the, the rest of my childhood. And so I was left as a five-year-old thinking, what's wrong with me? Why did dad not stick around? That gave me a lens through which I, I saw other relationships when people walked away. And so I just grew up believing the lie that I was insignificant, unwanted, rejected, and abandoned. And the more I come to know Christ and to find out what's true about me according to him, the more I'm able to put those lies aside. But man, they creep back up sometimes, don't they? That list of lies that we believe is, is long enough already, but it's always willing to grow if we let it. As we let other people's perspectives and the Facebook world and our own perceptions tell us lies about who we are. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, don't believe the lies. Some of them weren't paying attention when you started talking, so say it again. Don't believe the lies. Instead, I want you to believe the truth. And let me just share with you some of the truths that we find in Scripture. For some of you, this is going to just be a reminder, but you probably, if you're like me, need the reminder. And I'll start with this one. It's foundational. If you don't get this, it's really hard to receive the other truths that Jesus says about you. That in Christ, you are not what the world says. You're not what you've experienced. Those things don't define who you are. In Christ, you are a new creation. And it doesn't just mean uh, some things have changed. That actually means you are a new kind of being. That when the Spirit of God came to reside in you, your spirit was awakened. And so it's not just a new you, it's a new being. And all of the stuff that you've experienced in your past, the pain, the things that were done to you, the things that you did in college, all of those things are now gone. They bear no weight on you in Christ. And in Christ, you are forgiven. And in Christ, you were shameless, and you were blameless, and there is no condemnation on you. And you do have meaning, and you do have purpose. You're a masterpiece created by God and empowered by His Holy Spirit. So not only are you purposeful, you're powerful. You're loved and accepted and valuable, and gifted, you're complete, you're chosen, you're secure, and on and on the list goes of the truths that Scripture speaks over you. And if you're a follower of Christ, everything that I just mentioned and so much more is what's actually true about you and your spiritual reality. So maybe you need to step out of this worldly reality that just is so thick around us and see yourself as Jesus sees you. That's what the mind of Christ allows you to do. The mind of Christ not only affects how you view yourself, but it also affects what you hold on to. Look at Philippians chapter 3 now, verse 4. I want you to, to listen to some of the things that Paul could have held on to. All right, And if you were living back in, times, uh, in Paul's time in his culture, this would have been a big deal to you. So just act like you're impressed if you're not, okay? Paul says, and he's speaking about these people who are telling the Philippians, yeah, it's not enough. Yeah, maybe this is your experience, but it just isn't enough. And Paul says, oh yeah? Those guys think they've got something to boast about. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, Paul says, I've got more, y'all. I was circumcised on the eighth day kind of a big deal in Jewish culture, just so you know. He says, I am of the people of Israel, God's chosen people. And as if that is not enough, I am from the tribe of one of the favored sons, the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard to the law, I'm a Pharisee. As for zeal in that old religion, I was a persecutor of the church that I'm now building. As for righteousness based on the law, I was faultless. 
there's Paul's list. But instead of holding on to that list of achievement and that list of his heritage, look what he says in verse 7. Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What's more, I consider, what's the word? Everything. You awake? Is it on screen? It is, right there. Say it with me. What's more, I consider what? Everything. Everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them, all things, everything, garbage, that I may gain Christ. So you see Paul's list. It's a, a list that Paul could have measured his life by, certainly a list that other people looked at, and they measured Paul's life by that. It brings to mind that we also have our own list. Some of us have lists of achievements. And so we look at our past and the things that we've accomplished, and, and that's what we measure our life by. And if we've accomplished enough good things, then we feel good about ourselves. But if we've experienced enough failure, then we feel bad about ourselves. We're holding on to these lists and measuring our lives by these things. Some of us have a list of intentions, right? Here's what I intend to happen in my family. I've got it all mapped out, Chris. It's going to happen just like this, said the newlywed. We have a list of intentions about our career. Here's where it's going to go. Here's the ladder. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I'm going to retire. We have all these different kinds of lists of things that we intend to happen, and sometimes we pursue those lists, whatever the cost, and then when the list falls apart on us, that list of intentions, then what? There's a list of pain that some of us carry around because of our own past sin or experiences that we've had as a child or in a relationship. A, sin, a list of pride, a list of fear and doubt. There are lists even of good deeds. Some of the lists that we hold on to masquerade as really good lists. But in the end, guys, every one of these earthly lists that we hold on to are just garbage compared to knowing Christ. I got a, a, an email just a few weeks back. Um, I want you to see if you can identify this mom's list. And by the way, she knows that I'm going to read this. I have permission, all right? So don't think I am never talking to him. I'm never telling him anything. Um, usually, usually when we share an illustration, we've gotten permission. This one is the case. Here's what she says. I deeply desired being a mom. And so after experiencing infertility and then suddenly having a son and a daughter, I had everything I ever wanted. I began to see God as a threat to the things that I loved, and I doubted that he was worth following if his plan didn't match mine in regard to my kids. It was as I prayed for a friend's dying child that God broke my heart and revealed to me that he is a good, loving, faithful God no matter the circumstance. I recognized that I had made an idol out of my children and had devalued God in the process. And that significant moment became a marker in my life that helps me to face trials now with a deep dependence on the God who was constant despite the circumstances. Now, I share that with you because it's just another example of a list that someone holds on to, but, good news, a list that was recognized and traded for truth. What's your list? What are the things on your list? What kind of list is it? I wonder if you could call out your list and even label it. And here's why I think it's cool to label it. Um, there's this sense where... When you recognize what's on your list and you name what's on their list, you have a little bit of control over it now. It's no longer hidden. It's not overlooked. It's not ignored. But now when you recognize what you are holding on to and measuring your life by, you're able to hold that up to a really short list called knowing and growing in Jesus to see how it compares, to see why it needs to be let go. 
I wonder if you can, I, can say like Paul that whatever's on your list is meaningless compared to knowing Jesus. The spiritual mind can do that. And by the way, if you're a follower of Christ, you have a spiritual mind. But you have to choose to accept and apply what is true and what's best according to the mind of Christ. It changes what you hold on to. It also changes who you follow. You know, the view that we have of ourself, often um, there's a relationship there with what we hold on to. So how you view yourself often determines what you hold on to. And, and likewise, um, who you follow often determines what you believe about yourself and what you think you're supposed to hold on to. And so as you develop more and more, as you agree more and more with the spiritual mind that Jesus gives to you, that's why it's so important for you to recognize who you really are in Christ and to, to recognize what you're holding on to that you need to let go of, but also to recognize who you're following that you probably shouldn't be. At least to recognize who ought to be the greater influences in your life. Look at verse 17, Philippians chapter 3. Paul's encouragement to the church is this, join together in following my example. Don't answer out loud, but do you think you could say that to your neighbor right now with confidence? Hey, I got this. Just follow my example as I follow the example of Jesus. There's a lot of times I couldn't say that, but Paul could. He continues and says, and just as you have us as a model Keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Right? So Paul says, follow my example. Well, you've got to wonder, what does example look like? And if you don't know Paul, he gives you a little bit of a glimpse into the example that he's left. Up in verse 10, he says, I want to know Christ. Yes, I want to know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. In short, what he said so far is that Jesus has saved me for something, and I'm going to lean into whatever that might be. He continues in verse 13, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do. Forgetting what is behind. And by the way, if you don't know this, that doesn't mean you don't remember. Because we all remember what's behind us. Kind of hard to forget the experiences that we've had, the pain that we've suffered, even the successes that we've had. So he's not saying stop remembering. That's an impossible task. What he's saying is I don't let the things of my past bear weight on who I am today or the future that Jesus has for me. I let them go. Look at your neighbor and just say, let it go. Let it go. And now finish the song for them. No, don't. We've all had enough of that song. But that's what Paul is saying. Just let it go. I'm not going to consider what's happened in the past to have any bearing on my future. Instead, I'm going to strain toward and lean into what is ahead, pressing on to the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. The spiritual mind that is yours is set to follow those who are spiritually minded. That's who's supposed to be the influencers in your life. And if you look at Paul, at least the example that we have from him, uh, verses 12, 13, and 14, here's some things that we see about those who are spiritually minded. These are the kind of people that we're supposed to be following. First of all, uh, they have a spiritual dissatisfaction in life. And that spiritual dissatisfaction leads them to have a strong-willed devotion for more in their faith journey. It's the kind of people that want to be more like Jesus and experience more of the uncommon life he has for them and to do more in the kingdom. Not because they're going to earn any more favor or earn righteousness. They're not going to earn anything that's already been given them, but they just know there's something better and more, and they just can't sit where they are. They're satisfied with Jesus because Jesus satisfies, but they're not satisfied with staying in the same place Day after day after day, they want to take new ground in their faith journey. So knowing that, let me ask you, who are the influencers in your life? 
Who do you follow on Twitter, on Facebook? What blogs do you subscribe to? What books do you read? Who do you go to for guidance and counsel when you need it? Are they people who are spiritually minded, dissatisfied with just living life the same every day and wanting to pursue more of what Jesus has for them? Is that who you go to? And let me ask you this. What kind of spiritual influencer are you for those who you're leading? For your friends and your coworkers and your life group and your kids and your siblings? One of the questions I had to come to terms with as I went through uh, preparation for this message is, what are those who are following me learning from those that I follow? At the time, it was Mother's Day. I was thinking about my kids, and I recognized I have a 19-year-old son now that, thank the Lord, is more a product of God's influence than mine. But I'll tell you what I noticed as he was 14, 15, and 16, that he was heavily influenced by the people that influenced me. And he had gotten really good at arguing the politics of left and right. And when I started hearing that, come, and he's a smart kid, he's a kind kid, but that was consuming his world for a while. That is heartbreaking for a dad who follows Jesus. To hear that what your son is best at is arguing politics. So we changed that. God did it, thank goodness. But I recognize in looking at my son that I needed to change the influences in my life because that's not who I wanted to be. It's really not who I was in Christ. What I wanted my son talking about most is not what the left says, not what the right says, but what does Jesus say? And you know what? Without telling him, we're making this change, son. About two months ago, he said that to me. Dad, I just realized it is not about which political party is right. It's, right. it's about what Jesus said. I'm like, yes. Parenting, done. Not really. We know that it never is quite done. I'm 48. My mom still parents me. My dad does too. Um, but I say that just to say, what are the people in your life learning from those that you follow? A lot of times we would find that those who are following us in life group and in other areas of influence, that they're learning to compare themselves because we compare ourselves to those who have better things or more things or who are more spiritual. We're comparing ourselves all the time, and so our kids and other people in our life learn to compare themselves and, and never be content with where, uh, how Jesus has made them. I wonder if those who follow you are learning to complain about work, complain about your spouse, complain about your church, complain about this, complain about that. Is that what those who are following you are learning is how to complain about the things that aren't going the way they want them to go. So really, as we, as we look at this aspect of who do you follow, you really got to tag along to it, who do you lead? And what are they learning from watching you as you follow the leaders in your life? I want us to just do a quick activity as we prepare to close. We kind of walked quickly through this understanding that um, Jesus in us gives us his mind. It's a spiritual mind. It changes how we view ourselves, right? If we choose to accept and apply what's true and what's best, and our view of who we really are in Christ changes, as does what we hold on to in this world and who we follow. And so I want you right now just to find some space in your heart, just you and God. I'm going to lead you here, but pretend like I'm not here, okay? You can close your eyes if you want to. Maybe that'll help. But just between you and God, and you maybe can answer this on your own, but involve him in the conversation and ask him, God, what are the lies that I'm believing? Sometimes, guys, those lies feel like truth because we have experienced them in this earthly reality. But I hope you understand that what I'm saying is that in Christ, you need to forget what is behind don't let it bear weight on where you are right, right now. The only weight your past bears on you now is the redemptive weight that Jesus gives to all of the mistakes and the pain that we've experienced. What lies are you believing right now? Secondly, talk to God and say, okay, God, what's on my list? What am I measuring my life by that I shouldn't be?
And Father, who am I listening to? Who are the, the leaders that maybe are speaking poor influence into my life? And I wonder if you do this. We're going to actually close with this. So why don't you go ahead and stand with me. And I want you um, still just between you and God, maybe to hold those lies or those lists or those leaders in your hands. Some of you are like, I ain't going to do that. That's fine. But if you can, do it because I want you to recognize that you're letting go of something. You're giving something up. You're trading something. So open-handed, all right? Don't hold on tight. And just join your prayer with mine. And Father... In doing this, what we're saying is we're ready for a trade. Um, that we give these things to you in repentance. And we're changing our mind about what's true about us and about what we hold on to. And about the influences in our lives. And about those that we influence. So with repentance and, and agreement in our hearts, Father, we give these things to you. We don't want to hold on to these things and we certainly don't want them having a hold on us. Father, some of us here this morning are dealing with lies that we believed for decades. Others' deep lives that maybe from recent experiences, they need your healing. They need you and your spirit, through your spirit, to continue speaking truth and love and kindness and grace and hope to them. All of us, Father, are saying yes to your spirit, doing your work in our hearts. And so as we're giving these things up, Father, we also need to pause and say, what do you have for us? Because we know we don't walk away from the good Father empty-handed. We're glad to gather as your body, but Father, each individual here is your son and your daughter, ready to receive what you have for them. So speak truth, Father, to the hearts of the individuals that are here. With clarity, God, help them understand what list they need to let go of. And who it is even, Father, that would be a greater influence in their lives. And to all the things that you've laid on our hearts, Father, together we say... Amen. Guys, we're going to finish up the Philippians series next week. Josh is going to do that. He'll probably gripe about how fast the series was and blame it on me for making us go through it this fast. Just ignore it when he does that. <laughs> but come ready to receive a good word from him. And this week, leave here today walking in the spiritual reality of who you are in Christ. I look forward to seeing you again. Y'all have a great week.